the first thing I want to do is uh, first welcome everybody to uh, Diane Chacon's uh, lecture tonight. Uh, we're pleased to sh see everybody showing up tonight. Uh, but before we actually start with Diane Chacon, we want, I want to invite uh, Professor Debbie Fairbanks to come up and perform the opening ceremonies for us. And I'll, I'll let him explain uh, what he'll be doing here in the next uh, two or three minutes. So Professor Fairbanks can, can please uh, join me up here. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jerry. My name is Devery Fairbanks. I am a um, faculty here in Sociology and American Indian Studies at Iowa State. And I'm very honored to be asked to do this part of the show, okay? And um, I will be um, using a lighter. And I hope the fire marshal isn't in the building because this is the unconventional thing that that I often do here at Iowa State, and managed to avoid <coughs> all fire marshals so far. I'm very honored to be here. And I have uh, some plants that I would like to share with you, okay? I'm gonna use some tobacco and um, a few other items. I have some very common plant called um, white sage, which is a, often a sacrament that is often used. I'm going to use that. And then I'm going to use some, a very sacred plant called sweetgrass. And this grass is said to be the first grass that grow, has grown on Mother Earth. And uh, it grows in, in many areas. And what, I, what we say usually is that this grass is a, a sacred, holy plant and that it is always, always braided as we would braid our mother's hair. Those of you whose mothers have long hair like that, it's often braided, it has a very distinct smell to it. What I would like to do is light this and walk around this room, take a seat, okay? And we'll be done. Don't want to take up too much of the show. It has a smell that tends to get people alarmed a little bit. Um, a smell that is similar to the smell of marijuana. Not that you've ever smelled that. Um, I, have, I have smelled that on occasion. Oh, of course, for scientific study only, so, mind you. And I've never inhaled. I'm just going to walk around this room. And I'm, what I would like to do is bless this room. Okay. Generally what happens is each person in the room is blessed. But in this case, it'll just be, I'll just walk around the room. Okay. We'll all get the, we'll all get it. Okay. So I'll just go ahead and do that. And then we will be done. Okay. Thank you very much.
Good evening. My name is Evelina Galang, and I'm one of the uh, creative writers in the English department, and I have the pleasure of introducing Daniel Chacon this evening. I'm excited for you tonight because you are about to meet Daniel Chacon. After this evening, he will always be a part of your memory. When I first met him a few years ago, we were attending a writer's conference. There were about 2,000 attendees at this conference, and maybe 50 of us, if even that, were persons of color. There was a tendency for us, the writers of color, to drift into clusters of six or ten people. And at one of the panels, I remember the editor of a very well-known literary magazine was talking about good writing. He seemed to be talking about one way to read good stories. And this guy, sitting a few seats away from me, leaned forward, waved his hand in the air, and challenged the editor. This guy, Daniel Chacon, wanted to know who sets the standards. Chacon was talking about perspective and the idea that how a story unfolds can depend on the storyteller's cultural, social, and political perspective. And so knowing that, wouldn't the criteria shift too? The good editor insisted that there is one way of knowing what's good, what's good fiction. But I heard Chacon. Our many cultures have many ways of telling stories some circular, some linear, some purely abstract, and a good reader has to take that into account when he or she picks up a story. What I remember about Chacon is that he was not afraid to challenge the good editor and therefore the system. Is that a Chicano thing? The New York Times Book Review paid lots of attention to Chacon's first book of stories, gave him an entire page review. The review, while generally favorable, seemed to believe that Chicanos are a very distinct group of people, and since Chacon's stories didn't seem to fit what the reviewer's idea of um, Chicanos were, or maybe what we might call stereotype of Chicanos were, he didn't know if the stories were truly Chicano. How ironic, then, that my friends, working-class Chicanos in Denver, fought over the book, ate up the stories, and proclaimed, this guy sees the world the way I do. And here in Iowa, Dr. Paul Herman, business professor from Ecuador, read Godoy, um, Godoy Lives, the story of a Mexican man who leaves his family to assume a new name, new life, new identity in search of opportunity. Chacon's story kept him up, kept him from sleeping, made him think what a great way of saying what many of us go through. Daniel was right. There is more than one way to tell a good story, and the criteria is not universal because we do not all see the world in the same way though the world may insist there is only one way to see us. During Hispanic Heritage Month at Iowa State, we hope to see the various perspectives of the Latino experience. It's our mission, I hope, as educators, to encourage and respect this plural perspective that makes up the American people. In his bio, we learn that Daniel Chacon grew up, from, grew up in Fresno, California, the youngest of three children. He remembers his mother telling him, Daniel, you think too much. Stop it. The stories in, Chaco, uh, in, Ch in Chicano chicanery are born of his childhood, his memory, and his exquisite imagination. They explore the interior lives of working class Chicanos. He places his characters in the most uncomfortable situations, weaving humor and precise detail throughout the narrative so that the readers squirm, wonder what will happen next. How will this character come out looking good? Oftentimes, they don't. Oftentimes, his characters face not only their fears, but their most unattractive selves, and therefore, their humanity. While the characters are often fighting the external world, their greatest enemies seem to be the thinking that goes on in their heads. Like Daniel, they think too much, and their machinations, or the ch their Chicano chicanery, seem to get the best of them. Chacon has published in leading journals such as Ziziva, The New England Review, Bilingual Review, and The Colorado Review. His story, Godoy Lives, was named the best story of the year by Clackamas Review. Chacon has taught at institutions such as Modesto Junior College, where he was co-editor of the Puente program, which brings Chicano Chicana literature into the writing classes, and Southwest State Minnesota uh, University in Marshall, Minnesota. Currently, he teaches in the MFA program at the University of Texas at El Paso, where he's working on his novel, which was once called Joey Molina, but has a different title now and um, a second collection of short stories. Please help me welcome my dear friend and colleague to Iowa State, or as he writes in story number seven, it is with great honor and privilege that I now present to you a very special guest, tonight's keynote speaker, 
and the author of this story, Daniel Chacon. Excuse me, this is really gross, but I'm sorry about that. I, I just had some coffee, and uh, you know I hate the way the coffee taste stays in your mouth. And so I, I asked uh, uh, Noemi to bring me some gum, and she got some. That was good. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. You know, I I I I I flew over Des Moines last night, and uh, and and it brought back a lot of memories. Because I was living in Marshall, Minnesota, and you know, which is basically rural, Midwest, you know, cornfields and prairie, you know, and, uh, and it was weird because like a lot of the same, you know, like a lot of the images in that last year just kind of came back to me, and uh, it it seems so familiar, and I forgot how beautiful the skies are here. I mean, they're just wonderful, big skies, you know, and uh, I was very impressed with that. But um, anyway. Hi, my name is Daniel Chacon, and um, I'm going to uh, actually read a little bit from, from the book, Chicano Chicanery, and, uh, and a little bit from the novel that I just completed. I, well, actually, I completed a draft. I'm, you know, I'm very close to, to making it a, a final, final draft. And I'm pretty excited about it, and and I don't know, you know, I know that Evelina's students in her grad fiction class have, have used this book, and so you guys know the story. Did you read Too White? Not yet. No, you haven't read that story. Well, the main character in that story is the main character of the novel, and so I'm going to kind of read a little bit from this and a little bit from the from the uh, from, from the novel, and then in between I'll try to you know uh, address any concerns you may have, if indeed you have concerns. I know, like, you know, like, at least half of you are here for extra credit. <laughs> That's how I get my students to show up to places. Yeah. Uh, except, you know, I kind of feel guilty when I do a reading. I tell my students, you know, go to my reading. Yeah. They say, can we get extra credit? I, you know, I feel like there's a conflict there. So, you know, I says, you get extra credit in here. And they don't show up. <laughs> but I, I would like to... Um, Man, I've had a great time here. I arrived last night, and I went to Evelina's class, and then I, you know, I hung out with, uh, you know, with the uh, the master students last night. We had a great time, um, and uh, and then today I hung out with Paul. You know, we, we we had a great time, and I hung out with the with the Maya students. So I'd like to specifically thank some of the Maya students. Uh, I mean, they're just so comfortable. You, I, you know, it's like we hung out. It wasn't like I was, you know. Somebody was asking me, did you have a stressful day? And I go, no, I was hanging out with the Maya students. <laughs> and uh, so I want, I want to kind of, kind of acknowledge uh, some of them who, uh, who, who are responsible for this whole month, the Hispanic Heritage Month. Although, you know, personally, I would probably avoid the word Hispanic, but only because of, you know, reasons that are beyond the scope of this, this discussion. But I, I would like to, to, uh, to acknowledge them if, if they're all here. I don't know if they're all here. Well, there's um, Leticia Romo over here. She's a, a and, and these are these are people that are responsible for 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 all this stuff. There's a, is a Ray? Yeah, Ray Salcedo. Where's Ray? There he is, right there. Roy. Roy. I'm sorry. That's what I meant. I just have a different accent. I'm from Texas. Uh, Karen's, Karen's not here, is she? There she is. Karen, Karen's uh, Suniga. Uh, and Noemi uh, Rodriguez. Thanks for the chicle. Uh, where's Bobby? Is Bobby around? He's not here yet. He's not here yet? Okay, well, when he comes in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embarrass him. Uh, Alicia? Alicia? Is Alicia Anigas here? No, she's not here. Oh well, those those are the those are the ones I was hanging out with today. But also, you know, I, I you know, I just had had a great time today, and I really appreciate you making me feel so at home here. 
at Iowa. I feel more at home at Iowa, in Ames, Iowa, in, in one day than I did in Marshall, Minnesota, in one year. Seriously. And, and, you know, and I mean, you guys, you guys have a university here, man. Over at Mar anybody ever been to Marshall, Minnesota? You've been there? When? How long ago? Two years ago? Okay, I was there last year, man. It's like a hospital. <laughs> Seriously, you, you, are, you enter the building and you don't get out. At the end of the day, it spits you out the other end. And, and there's, it's not like a university where they have grass and like a pond and, you know, and, and crazy preachers and, you know, I mean, they, they got nothing like that at Marshall. It was weird, man. It was like working at a hospital. I'm serious. Like three o'clock, the halls are empty. And, 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 you know, and, and, you know, and I, I don't think personally, you know, you might, you know, argue with this. I don't think that I'm race conscious per se, but it was, it was a very homogenous university and, and it was extremely different from what I'm used to in California or any place I've ever been. And so it, it was weird, but this place, man, you know, you guys are, you guys are cool out here, man, really. What manner of love is this is the name of my novel, I think. I, I can still be persuaded to change the title, so if afterwards you, you, know, you say, you know, I got a good title for you, Chuck Owen, I, I'm, I'm, de I'm definitely very willing to listen. But I'm gonna read you the first, the, the opening paragraphs, okay? And then, and then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how it happened. You know, I, I was looking in the newspaper the other day, and it said that Chacon is going to talk about the place of the Chicano writer in American culture or some, something like that. And I go, really? I'm not going to talk about that, I'm sorry, because I don't know. I'm just going to read a little bit and then I'll, you know, I, and, 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 you know, things will come out as, as, as I'm talking. Am I talking too much? <laughs> Jerry, am I talking too much? I like this guy, man. Jerry Garcia, just his name makes me feel like, you know, <laughs> like I know him, you know? And some of his students, I think, are here. I, I recognize one guy. Where, where'd he go? The whole class is here. The whole class is here? I recognize you. Ellen, was it? Yeah. And uh, you? Yeah, you're in the class. And you? Yeah, that was a cool class. I talked for, yeah, I was like, I went in there and I, I, I know, I'm digressing again. I do that a lot. Uh, I, I went in the class and I started talking. And I, said to, I said to Jerry, I said, how much time do I got left? You know, I thought I had, didn't have much time. He goes, 40 minutes? And I go, oh, okay, I only need five more. So I start talking again. And then I says, Jerry, how much time do I have? He goes, five minutes? <laughs> so apparently I'd been talking th for 35 minutes, and I didn't even realize it. Anyway, has anybody read the book other than Evelina's students? Okay, well, apparently you guys didn't read this story, but it's about this guy named Joey Molina. And Joey Molina is uh, the main character of this, of this novel. And I'm just going to read the first couple of pages. This is like, when you open the book, this will be the first thing that you read. All right. <laughs> oh, I got to be me. No, yeah, I hate, I hate being oppressed by a, a podium. You know, I like this shit because I can do a Jerry Springer stuff. And look. This is kind of cool. Yeah, but, and, and I don't think it's arrogance that causes me to walk around like this. I think it's more insecurity, you know? Okay, what manner of love is this? This is just like the first three pages, okay? Security blanket. If you could travel back in time and you entered the giant mouth of Kmart, you'd be sucked into a warm belly of family fun and fantasy. Fat ladies holding new kids' clothes up to the lights, children riding 10-cent mechanical horses, Young mothers pushing strollers full of purchases while their babies slept happy in their arms. It smelled of submarine sandwiches and popcorn, and the ceiling lights blared so bright that the buzz of electricity competed with the dings of the registers and the sloshing of the icy machines, and a mass of voices rose to the ceiling like cheers as the loudspeaker announced to Kmart shoppers that at the blue light spinning from a pole like a police siren were special bargains. People pushed their way to the light as if it were payday. If they went fast enough, the packages of products blurred by their sights as if driving through the cliffs of a colorful canyon until forced to stop in the middle of an aisle because it was blocked by a Chicano father and his boy. 
Now that's a color, the father said, pointing at the hot pink house paint. The boy lifted a can of purple paint and smashed it on the floor and watched it splatter on the faces of frightened Kmart workers. This is unacceptable, he yelled. The father stepped away from the shelf to see how the paint stood out among the other colors, his fake leather sandals squeaking with each step. His hairy thighs and calves were thick and masculine, but his ankles were skinny and hairless like a girl's. His shadow stretched across the aisle. He opened his arms to indicate the hot pink paint as if he were about to hug the can. See, Joey, he said, that's unique. Joey swept the paint cans off the shelves, colors colliding on the floors like a Jackson Pollock painting. Look at this shoddy display. Who's responsible? The nervous employees trembled with fright. Hey, idiot, the father said. Get your ass over here. What is it, Dad? You see that hot pink? Now that's unique. The father put his hands on his hips, and the tattoo spider on his chest seemed to reach from the sides of his tank top undershirt. The boy stood next to him and put his hands on his hips, too. What's that mean, he said, looking at their shadows side by side. Unique? Better than everyone else, the father said. A lady racing through the aisles came right at them and had to swerve her cart around because she was going too fast to stop. Excuse me, she said as she passed. Yeah, said Joey, the best. He flapped his arms like wings. He flapped and flapped and his shadow waved goodbye and shot up into the high beam ceilings. Tomorrow, we'll get up bright and early before, and paint before it gets too hot. Tomorrow, Joey asked. The father had two fingers on his chin, rubbing it in thought. Bright and early, he said. But tomorrow's Saturday, Joey said. Yeah, no shit, Sam Spade, the father said. Well, what about cartoons? His dad glared at the sun. The dad glared at the sun. His, the dad, his black hair was cut short and slicked back around his ears, and the boy could smell the Mexican hair stuff he put there on weekends. How old are you, the father said. What are you, 21? The green-tinted five o'clock shadow on his face made him look like a gangster. I'm 12, Joey said. He backed up. Hmm, I think you act a lot younger than that. He looked at the boy like he thought he was lying, then back at the shelf. Boys your age still like cartoons? Well, I do, but I'm what? Unique? He chuckled. You're okay, he said. Then he actually tousled his boy's hair like a father on TV. So can I watch them? Maybe join you guys later? His father grabbed a fistful of hair and pulled back. Boy, why did you have to go and ruin the moment? So that, that's, that's the introduction to the father. And, and uh, I'm going to, I asked for this chalkboard because I wanted to, to, to write this down. You know, because, it, because it's a novel, I mean, you can't really, you know, follow uh, the characters. Well, you can, but, but I, I thought I'd give you like a little, like the father, he's 36. His name's William, and he's like a, a, a Chicano. I mean, he's got tattoos on his arms. He's a working class guy. And, uh, and uh, Rachel is the mother, and she's about 34. Rachel is from Michoacan, Mexico, and she still talks with an accent, but she has, she has blonde hair and blue eyes, and so a lot of people don't realize she's Mexican until she talks, you know, and she has that accent. Um, William, he's from California. He doesn't talk with an accent, doesn't even speak Spanish very effectively. Um, then there's Billy. Billy is the brother, the older brother. He's 14, and he's got kind of like hair all the way down to here. He looks very Indian, very long, straight black hair. Um, and he picks on Joey a lot. Joey, the main character, is 12, and Joey essentially is ignored by everybody in the family. And, and then there's Vero. Uh, Vero is uh, 15, and uh, she's, she's at the age where she doesn't even like being around her family. She's embarrassed to be around her family. They're not cool enough, that kind of thing. Uh, very, very, very rebellious. Um, Joey, like I said, he's kind of ignored by everybody in the family. And um, he's, he's, oh, my ticket, I'm just get hot. He's, he's, he's always ignored by everybody in the family. That's cool, I can put it here. Thanks, man. Um, and they're always, you know, his dad's always saying, boy, you're worthless. Boy, you're, you know, you're a piece of crap, you know, all this stuff. And, and after a while, Joey begins to believe it. And he doesn't really have any friends except for this really geeky white kid that lives across the street. And one day the kid, you know, says, I can't walk home with you, Joey, because I'm going to apply, I'm going to try out for the school play. 
And Joey that day has to stay out after school. And on his way out uh, after school, he goes, he kind of stumbles upon the auditions and he sees the girl that he's in love with. Her name's, ironically enough, Sherry Garcia. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and he's in love with this girl, man. And he's only 12 years old at this point, right? The novel takes place when he's 12, when he's 16, and then when he's 26. So I'm going to read you portions when he's 12. But he, he sees Sherry Garcia there, and the, and the teacher sees him and says, you're going to try out. And so Joey says, yeah, I'm going to try out. And he gets the lead part. He just finds that he's so good at acting. And, and, and something changes in his life at that point. He realizes that there's something he's good at. All his life, people have been telling him that he's not good at anything, that he's just worthless. And so he, he gets the lead part, and he can't believe it. And so he, um, he goes home after learning that, that, uh, that, that he got the lead part, and he's going to tell his family about it, but he's going to wait until dinner time. Um, and so this is the scene right after he gets home, you know, uh, from knowing that he, that he got the part, and... He's just all excited. He's going to tell his whole family. And like I said, there's the family if you need a visual. Um, Rachel is clear the mother, right? That's cool, right? Okay. Anyway, this is just because I do scenes. I do scenes. I don't do a lot of exposition. So I'm just going to read you from scene to scene. I don't know what to do with my microphone. Why the smirk, Rachel asked as asked Joey as she slapped slabs of slimy filet of cod into beaten eggs, then flip-flopped them into a pile of breadcrumbs. Just happy, he said. She wiped her hands on a dish rag with the back of her hand, and with the back of her hand brushed away a bead of sweat on her forehead. The sun came in from the kitchen window above the sink, filling her hair with light so that it looked white and brought out the brightness of her eyes, blue like water. Me too, she said. I'm ecstatic. You know what that means? No, he said. She walked across the kitchen and pulled a pencil from a jar and a piece of scratch paper from the counter, and she wrote on it, her long fingers graceful and smooth, E-C-S-T-A-T-I-T, -T -T, ecstatic. What do you think it means, she asked. She looked at it closely, scrunched up his face and thought, does it have to do with electricity, like when you walk across a carpet? No, she said, that's static. Guess again, ecstatic. Billy walked like a zombie through the kitchen, right between his mother and brother, and headed for the sink to fill a glass of water. The sun in the window caused him to squint his eyes and avert his head like he was being tortured. Around his shoulders, reaching to the ground, he held a white sheet. Look at this word, Billy, Rachel said. It's a new one. No, thanks, he said, yawning, as he, and, and he walked out of the kitchen with his glass. Rachel and Joey looked at each other and smiled. Whenever she learned a new word at the lawyer's office where she was a receptionist, she would come home eager to share it, but Joey was the only one who listened. He had his favorite words, which he used whenever they seemed to fit the moment, and oftentimes when they didn't, making up meanings and fitting them into any conversation. But some words he respected so much that he was only satisfied to use them correctly, words like trite and diminutive. He liked how they made him another person, smart, different from all the others. With such language, he thought of himself as rich, driving a car, living in a big house, being able to walk the aisles of any store and buy anything he wanted, because people who used such words, he was sure, were like that. When Rachel wrote them down, he kept pieces of paper. He kept the pieces of paper as if they were dollars, words like peripatetic, anathema, and superfluous. He liked to thumb through them, smell the paper, wave them in front of his friends. Now he looked closely at the new word, ecstatic. I give up, he said. Very happy, she said. Right now I'm ecstatic. So does that mean if you're very ecstatic, said Joey, you're very, very happy? Well, I guess it would. Well, that's what I am, he said. Very ecstatic, very, very ecstatic. You look it, she said. Why? He wanted to tell her, but he'd save it for dinner. I'll tell you later. Soon his father would be home from work and they would eat and he would tell the family the good news. He sat in front of the TV waiting, smelling the fish frying in lard. William was in a good mood when he got home, throwing his metal lunch box, un box underhanded onto the couch. He wore work pants and a blue work shirt with his name patched on the chest. His black hair was flat, pressed against his skull from the hard hat he had worn all day. 
Joey, 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 he said quickly as he slipped off his shirt, exposing his chest, the tattoo spider between his breasts. He had long black hairs growing around his nipples and some on the chest. Not a lot, just a few strands as thick as spider legs. Rachel ran from the kitchen, wiping her hands. Hey, baby, he said, opening his arms. She ran into them like a schoolgirl. He held her in his arms and kissed her on the forehead, then the cheek, then the neck, and she said, Stop it, William. <laughs> the father lay on the couch reading the newspaper, which by the time Rachel announced dinner ended up spread flat across his chest while he snored. Joey was the first one at the table sitting straight up with good posture, hands clasped. clasped. I'm ecstatic, he said, that we're finally going to eat. <laughs> she called for Billy and Vettel. Joey sat and waited, but no one came. William snored, the sound of a monster gargling. Rachel put a plate of tortillas at the head of the table where he would sit. Then she sat down at her seat and pulled sections of paper towels from the roll in front of her and placed one near each plate. She called, William, Billy, Veronica. William got up, lovingly touched Rachel's cheek with his thumb as if she were a head he had sculpted from clay, and he sat at his chair and began to eat. I forgot to tell you that William is an artist. He's a worker, but he comes home and he makes these heads of clay in the garage, and he's obsessed with this. He'll spend all night out in the garage making these heads of clay, and so that's what it's referring to. Billy, Vero, she called again. Joey feared that his father, who ate fast, would be done and gone from the table before the rest of the family came. Go get your brother and sister, Rachel said. Joey walked into the bedroom where, uh, where Billy was curled up in a sheet, listening to a handheld radio, singing along with it. Mom says, come and eat now. I'm coming, he said. Then he went to Beto's room and knocked on the door and listened. Beto, what? It's time to eat. I'm not hungry, she said. Beto, go away. I think you should be here, Joey said. Some news might make you feel good. Mom told me already, she said. What? That, how could you do that? Just go away. She didn't come, but Billy did, reluctantly, and wrapped in his sheet. Where's your sister, Rachel asked. She don't want to come, Joey said. He gobbled his food while Billy picked at it, bored. She disappeared to talk to Veto, and then she came back and said, she's not feeling well. Horseshit, William said. She thinks she's too good to eat with us. Joey was ready to make his announcement. He wiped his mouth and formed the first word on his tongue, but before he could say anything, Rachel said, we have some news for you kids. She looked at her husband and smiled like a girl. Then she looked at Joey and said, I think it'll make you kids ecstatic. William, would you like to tell the children? You do it, he said, his mouth full of food, a few grains of wet rice falling out as he spoke. Billy perked up, tell us what? I have an announcement too, Joey said, but no one heard him. Okay, I'll tell you, she said. Tell us what? Kids, your father is an has been applying for better jobs. Jobs that pay more money and have more chance of an, uh, to advance. And he got an interview for one he applied for. It's a good job. More money, better work. It means we can have a few more things. Can I get a stereo, asked Billy. Maybe, she said. Hold it right there, Mrs. Santa Claus, William said. Don't count your eggs before they fall from the chicken's ass. Well, most likely, she said, we'll start off by getting some decent furniture. She looked around the house at the torn brown couches at the yellow formica top table they ate on. Every time I look at this, it makes me embarrassed. I wouldn't wish this furniture on my worst enemy. Horse shit. This furniture is fine, the dad said, his mouth full of food. You just want life to be like the Brady Bunch, where everyone's rich and beautiful. This is reality, Biaka. Get used to it. She crumpled the paper towel she held in her hand and set it on her plate. The point is, things might be changing. The point is, vieja, if you think material things are going to keep you happy, you're in, big for, you're in for a big disappointment. In here, he pounded on his chest. That's where you'll find it. Anyway, kids, he doesn't necessarily have the job, but we're pretty sure they'll make him an offer. Your old man could be a big shot. It's a supervisor position. But, she said, if he gets it, we'll have to move. Out of Fresno, asked Billy. Out of state, she said. Leave California, Joey asked, horrified. It's in Oregon. You mean by Washington? That's the state above Washington, right? Asked Billy, excited. The capital is Salem. Very good, she said, but it's before Washington. The name of the town is Medford. Where the hell is Medford, Joey asked, saying Medford as if it were something nauseous. Don't talk that way, his dad said, pointing a rolled up tortilla. He goes on the interview Monday. 
They're going to pay for our gas and all our meals. They're going to get a, they're going to get one of the wives to show me around town while they show your father the factory. They're even going to put us in a hotel. Imagine that. Will it have room service? Asked Billy. Yes, and the company will pay for everything, she said. Even a hamburger, asked Billy, and a milkshake? She said anything stupid, the dad said. Wow, said Billy. It would be so nice to get out of California, Rachel said. The crime is just getting out of hand. The gangs, the drugs, Oregon's not like that. Nothing was decided, she said, but the part they would like, she was sure, was that on Monday and Tuesday, they don't have to go to school. They would spend those two days at Grandmother Molina's. Better would stay with their cousin Norma. But I have to go to school on Monday, Joey said. Tomorrow, Saturday, then Sunday. That's four days of no school. Since when did you like start what since when did you start liking school? his dad asked. You flunk everything you take. You're the dumbest kid in class. I was cast in the play, he said. That's what I wanted to tell you. The school play. I got the lead role. I'm gonna be in the play. Not if we move, you're not, she said. Plays are for sissies, Billy said. But shut up, before I get up and kick your ass, his dad said. Can I help, asked Billy? We can make this a family project. <laughs> Selfish little shit, his dad mumbled. Okay, so uh, what end? Um, um, uh, what 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 ends up happening? Of course, is is the family. He does get the job, and then he takes the family out to eat. And as they take as they go out to eat, they get in this big old fight. And Vero, the fifteen year old, says, "I'm not going to go with you." And and the father just starts cussing her out right in the middle of the restaurant. And Joey decides he hates his family. And he'd rather stay in Fresno, so he decides he's going to run away. And um, so the next morning, he, he runs away, and he goes to Sherry Garcia's house. And he's, and he's going to tell Sherry Garcia that he's running away. Sherry Garcia, they're both 12 years old. She's from East L.A. And, and, and her parents moved to, uh, to California to get away from the ga- or to Fresno to get away from the gangs. Um, because it's pretty bad over there. And so anyway, he's, he's in love with Sherry Garcia and he goes to see her. Sherry lives with her mom. Her mom is a, a cocktail waitress. And um, so anyway, this is, it, 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 this is that scene with Sherry Garcia. Joey walked to the apartment buildings where Sherry lived and he knocked on her door. She answered wearing jean cutoffs and a white tank top, her hair in, pony, in a ponytail. She seemed surprised and happy to see him, and then she leaned against the door frame, her skinny hips sticking out, and she crossed her arms. Joey could see that she was wearing a bra, the straps coming off her shoulders. Joey Molina, she said. He told her about Oregon and what he was going to do. He spoke so quickly, like a child who didn't want to forget anything, how he was going to run away because he didn't think it was fair that he had to go now that he had finally found something in his life that mattered to him. I think you better come in, she said. The apartment was cluttered with new furniture, wooden stuff and brass colored trim, wooden stuff with brass colored trim, the kind of things his mother would dream of owning. In the small dining room was a giant hutch that reached to the ceiling, dainty dishes displayed behind the glass, and a wooden table with elegantly carved chairs and with, with red velvet backs. But the room was so small that it felt like storage space, like you would have to walk sideways to reach the kitchen, and the entire apartment felt crap cramped, the furniture too big for the space. Sherry led him to an oversized couch and they sat. It was the most comfortable couch he had ever sat in. And he held on the cushions with both hands and tested the softness by moving up and down. Sherry did the same and they were bouncing next to each other. Then he looked around the house. You got nice stuff, he said. My mom likes nice things, she said. Over the TV was a large painting of a matador and a muscular bull, the svelte man twisting his torso, his red cape flaring over the bull's horns. My grandma has that one, Joey said. I love bullfights. Have you ever been to one, she asked. Joey shook his head. We went, to, we went and saw one in Tijuana, she said. It was so cool. You ever been to TJ? Joey said no, but that his sister had, and that she brought him back a hell's angel. A what? Excuse me. A what? He described the life-size skull with a spiked motorcycle helmet like a Nazi, with coin slot on top because it was really a piggy bank. And he remembered how his dad looked at it when she put it on the table, how he shook his head and said, that ain't art, it's kitsch. I could do a better head than that. 
And he did, too. A series of skulls with motorcycle helmets. His Hell's Angels series. Faces so scary, they looked like they were indeed from hell. Worms boring from their skulls. But you couldn't put coins in their heads because they weren't kitsch, they were art. He and Sherry watched cartoons on the giant color console TV, and during commercials they talked. How will you live, she asked. I'll figure something out, he said, and she nodded. During the next commercial, she said, I don't know, Joey, and she punched him lightly on the arm. He looked at where she hit him, and then he looked at her. Ow, he said. Ow, she said, scooting in close to him. The cushions gave in under her weight and pushed him a little closer to her. They were face to face. Are you being realistic, she asked. He looked into her black eyes. She seemed so much older than 12. She seemed like an adult, and he wanted to kiss her. He backed up a little and said, like a man, I could handle myself. She grabbed his wrists and bent them. Oh, yeah? Prove it. Joey could feel it. She was stronger than he was. <laughs> her grip was tight, and her thin arms had muscles pulsating from under the skin. So rather than fight her, he pretended to give in. And he bent back his wrists and said, you win. She came in close, bending his wrists back further, her face so close to his that he could smell her breath like toothpaste, and he felt himself flushed with excitement. Are you sure you can handle yourself, she said. Her nose touched his. Come on, she said, bending his wrists until they hurt. Fight. I don't fight, girls, he said, slipping from her grasp and shaking off the pain. But then she grabbed his hand, entwined her fingers into his, and again he could feel the strength. But she just held his hands. He wondered what her life was like in L.A., what kind of neighborhood she grew up in. Was she forced at an early age to be tough? He wondered if she could conceive of the fact that Joey, at 12 years old, had never even been in a fight. He didn't know how to fight. He didn't live in a nice neighborhood. There were poor people, but it was a small neighborhood, and everyone knew each other, and no one fought. He liked all his neighbors, and they liked him. And they were isolated by fig orchards and cow pastures and highways from the rest of the city so strangers rarely passed through. Come on, she said, pulling his hand back and forth. Let's see what you're made of, Molina. Can you fight, he said, trying to ease his hands away, but she pulled on them. You better believe it, she said. How about you? Uh, I'm a lover, not a fighter, he said. <laughs> a lover, she said, like she was impressed, her ponytail swinging and falling over her mouth. She had to swing her head to get it out. But I can take care of myself, he said. Prove it, she said. He could feel her warm breath on his face. Suddenly, from another room, they heard a woman moan, and Sherry let go of Joey and said, Oh, God, here it comes. She sat with her back against the couch and crossed her arms. What, Joey asked. Their morning sex, she said. She lifted the remote control off the coffee table and raised the volumes. Joey had never before seen remote control, but he was more interested in what was going on down the hall. <laughs> The moans got louder, and the woman said, oh, yes. <laughs> Sherry turned off the TV and stood up. Come on, she said. Joey was disappointed that she let him outdoors. They walked down the cement steps and walked around the apartments and then sat on the sun-warmed hood of a car, but he kept looking at the window of her apartment, wondering what morning sex looked and felt like. I wish you could stay with me, she said. That'd be fun. Yeah, he said. We could wrestle, she said. Do you like to wrestle? He would like to wrestle with her, he thought, but he'd lose, and that intimidated him. He watched her as she leaned against the car, her hands on the hood behind her back. She looked around as if she owned the neighborhood. Suddenly, he felt that he wasn't good enough for her, wasn't strong enough. Still, he thought, she was so pretty, and it would be nice cuddling up with her every night before sleep and waking up with her in the morning to wrestle. <laughs> you know, Joey, she said, the play ain't that important. I mean, you have a family. Yeah, and I hate them all, he said. Don't even say that, she said. You don't know them, he said. I know family's family, she said. All that furniture we got and this cheap...